It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. Uh, someone said, are you going to sing this morning? And I said, no, I better not. I've still got this cold in my upper head here. Uh, but we are continuing our Won't You Be My Neighbor, Love Where You Live series. And we're in part two. Um, I I'm just so overwhelmed by this church how you've been praying for me and my family and, and sending cards and, and just taking care of us. And I just, I just want to thank you very much for uh, your, your care and your love for us while we were down with the flu. Gross. I've decided that I'm never going to get sick again. Uh, if only I had the power to say that, right? So this morning we're going to be diving back into Won't You Be My Neighbor? And I am sporting my iconic Mr. Rogers sweater. And if you haven't noticed my beautiful tie, I know that I have like three ties. And if you look real close, you see the little bitty black sheep on my, my tie. And so that's me and my family. Just so you know a little bit of history about me, if you don't know me at all. I am the black sheep in my family. And uh, my parents were so thrilled that I became a minister because they were just glad that I wasn't getting in trouble. Uh, and that was, that was a, a big thing for them. Uh, I want to thank you for being here, and I also want you to, to, to kind of open your mind a little bit this morning. We're going to be talking about this television show, which was around for over 30 years. It, was, it had helped shape so many individuals. Through Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, Fred Rogers was an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church. And one of the things that he was able to do is he was able to go into people's homes every day and tell them that they are loved mightily. And that they are unique and special. And one of the things I think is extremely important is the fact that Mr. Rogers was not necessarily a show that came in and, and taught you how to count or tell you your colors. He did some of that too. But one of the coolest things that he did, he was able to look you in the eye and remind you that you were loved. And I don't know about you, but in this day and age... We all need to know that we are loved. Because there's so many chaos, there's so much chaos in this world, and there's so much bitterness, and there's so much anger, and there's so much hatred. It seems that every time I turn on the television or the computer or turn on my phone, that there's, there's this, just this animosity towards one another. And it, and it breaks my heart because I think about Jesus. And I think about how that he was willing to leave heaven itself to live a life that some of us would be called very difficult. And died a humiliating death on the cross just to tell you how special you are and how much you are loved. And yet Satan has got us all flip, twist, tied, confused. That we look at our neighbor and we see an enemy. We look at our friend and we see somebody who is not special. And it breaks my heart. When Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood started in 1968, he started talking about certain things that most children's shows still don't talk about. He talked about death. He talked about divorce. He talked about war. He talked about racism. In 1969, he had an episode with Officer Clemens. And this is 1969. He invited this actor to portray this police officer. And at first, the actor said, I don't want to play the popo. I thought, seriously, that's what he said. He said, I don't want to play a police officer. Are you crazy? But Mr. Rogers, with his way, he encouraged him and said, Francois, I really think that it's important for children to know who the helpers are in their neighborhood. And so he convinced Francois to be this officer in 1969. For those of us who know our history, 1969 was not a very good year dealing with racial tensions. 
In Florida, there were things going on where there was actual segregation problems, and, and there was these protests where people were getting in the, getting into pools because there were no, you weren't allowed to have black people in a white pool. And so there would be these people going in and dumping cleaner all over everybody to try to clean the pools because of the racial problems with mixed swimming. So Mr. Rogers says, I know that racial tensions are evil. And he says, how in the world can I share that we are all God's family? And so what he does is he invites Officer Clemens in his neighborhood on a hot day to, to put his feet in a kiddie pool. And the officer at first says, no, 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 it's, it's okay, no, no, thank you. But Fred Rogers insists, go ahead, let's just take your shoes off. The officer rejects, says, no, 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 I don't even have a towel. And Fred Rogers says, you can use my towel. Folks, this isn't just children's television. This is the kingdom of God made manifested before millions of children that helped change their understanding of what racism looked like. About 30 years later, 1993, this is actually the last episode with Francois Clemens in it. He retired from the show, went on to be a university professor. Do you remember 1993? Do you remember 1992? No. Racial segregation had broken out again. There was animosity. There was enemies. There was fighting in the streets. And again, Fred Roger invites Francois and says, will you please come and help us show these children what a neighbor looks like. And so again, at this little kiddie pool, something so simple and yet so powerful, these two men dip their toes in this water. And in fact, at this moment, Francois begins to sing a song. And I want to read it to you. Because I'm not going to sing it for you. It's story time. Hello, neighbors. I just lost my place. Ezra told me, it says, you should get up instead of singing and say, hello, neighbors. This is a Bible. Today, we're going to learn from God's word. And I think that's really cool. I may do that in a minute. But I want to read this song to you that Francois sung while his feet were dipped in the pool, while the world burned around. There are many ways to say I love you. There are many ways to say I care about you. Many ways. Many ways. Many ways to say. I love you. The song goes on to, to, to demonstrate some of the many ways. But this morning I want to show you another story. In John chapter 13. And I want to show you a way that Jesus demonstrated one of many ways that he loves us. John chapter 13, I'm going to read in verse 1, the beginning. And I want us to dive into God's word and to see what it is to look like a good neighbor. Now before the festival of Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, 
and that he had come from God and was going to God. He got up from the table, took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered, You do not know now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. Peter said to him, You'll never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you'll have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, One who is bathed does not need to wash, except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he washed their feet and put on his robe, he returned to the table and he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? I love this story because what Jesus does is, this is, this is right before the garden. This is right before the betrayal. This is right before the trial, the beating, and the crucifixion. Hours before. Jesus has one last lesson for his neighbors. And he says, I want to show you something. I want to show you a way that shows how much I love you. I love how the scripture says, looking upon them, he loved them. Folks, this world needs more love. This world needs a, a, a body of people who are willing to, to stand up and, and to demonstrate Jesus' love. But church, before we get stuck on what we need to do to proclaim the good news, before we get stuck on the right actions we need to take to share the gospel with the lost, we must begin with the motivation of love. Jesus says, if you want to understand what it is to follow me, you must be motivated by love. I believe the writer of 1 Corinthians, Paul, says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, though I give my body to be burnt, though I die a martyr's death, if I do any of that, but without love, I'm just a loud noise. I remember when I was about 10 years old, we were having a, a parade. And I remember the, all the excitement and all the music and the people were throwing candy out. I remember it being such an event. And I remember this one particular time, the fire truck came through. And it laid on the horn, you know? And you're like this close to the fire truck, and it lays on your horn, and you're like, ah! And in that moment, that horn drowned out all the music. That horn drowned out all the fun. It was just painfully gross. Church, whenever we try to do anything without a heart of love, it's as painful as that fire truck siren right in your ear. It is offensive. It is gross. We must, as a church, begin to recognize, to know who our neighbor is, to know, to know who Jesus is, to be the, the, the body of Christ that we've been called to be. We must begin with love. A motivation of love. Because everything else will not work. So one of the lessons I think Jesus is teaching us here in John chapter 13 is that he's about to demonstrate this great act of love. He's wanting to teach a lesson for them to carry on for the hours, the days, the weeks, and the years to follow.
But Jesus begins with love, and I love that John picked up on that as he recounts this. But Jesus has more to tell us. Verse 3 says, Jesus, knowing the Father, had given all things into his hand, and he had come from God and was going to God. The time had come. Verse 4 says, he got up from the table. took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. He then poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wiped them with a the towel he was tied with. I love this image of Jesus because this is the creator of the universe. This is God-made flesh. And what he does just doesn't make sense in this world. That's what I would have done. 
but not Jesus. He washed Judas' feet. He washed Peter's feet. In just a few hours, Peter's going to betray Jesus, deny him, call down curses upon himself, say, I never knew the man. And Jesus is cleaning his feet. Church, if we want to be a church of, of Jesus' people, then we have to stop thinking our opinions are the only opinions. We've got to meet people where they are, in their broken places, in those broken moments in their lives where they don't look like us, they don't talk like us, and thank God they are different than us. We have to lay aside our pride and get to work washing other people's feet. You see, when I was going for this lesson, and I read this part where Jesus is washing his followers' feet, I, I could not keep that image of Officer Clemens and Fred Rogers out of my mind. Do you think Fred Rogers came up with that own idea of washing feet himself? Or maybe he remembered the story of Jesus and decided to love his neighbor. Finally, Jesus gives us something that motivates us. Be motivated in love. Needs to be modeled with humility. But finally, it's just, it's just very powerful. I'm going to skip ahead. And this is after Judas leaves the table. Verse 31 it says, when he'd gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. I am with you only a little while longer. You will look for me. As I said to the Jews, now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment. That you love one another just as I have loved you. You should also love one another. Look at verse 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I'm going to say that again. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I'm going to read this again. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What is Jesus saying is the marker of discipleship? <coughs> love. Love demonstrated. We talked about how love needs to motivate us. We talked about how we must be a model of humility. But folks, I'm here to tell you something. Those people out there in the world, they don't care your concept of the inspiration of God. That people out there who are hurting and dying, lost in their pain and their anguish, they don't care how many books of the Bible there are. The people who are hurting and the people who have lost loved ones and the people who are struggling, wondering if they really have value, do not care about some of our doctrines. Do we get that? Jesus says, you will be known as my people not because of your stance on X, Y, and Z, but you will be known as my followers if you are showing love to one another. If we want to be a neighborhood church, if we want to be a church where Jesus is Lord, then that means, church, we've got to stop complaining and start acting in love. That means we're going to have to lay aside our pride. That means we're going to have to get our hands dirty. That means that all of it has to be done in the proper loving motivation because we love people, because God loves us.
friend of mine has a favorite quote that he always uses, and he says, there's nothing in me to bring people to Jesus. He says, all I am is a beggar trying to tell another beggar where to find bread. And I thought that's a really powerful statement. There's nothing in me that says, Joe, is something special. Only the fact that Jesus loves me and that he died for me. I can be happy in that. And I can tell somebody else that they're loved too. And that Jesus loves them. This morning, if you're wanting to be a good neighbor, I want you to be my neighbor. <coughs> because Jesus moved into my neighborhood. And when Jesus moved into my neighborhood, things kind of changed. It started with my heart. I knew that I was loved. Because he demonstrated. I was thankful. Because I was loved. And because I was loved and because I was thankful, I was able to surrender my life and control of my life over to Jesus and say, you know what? I can't do this myself. I've tried to fix all my own problems and I can't. But Jesus promised me that he would come in me and change my life for his glory and for the glory of God forever. Church, if you have a need that we can pray for you this morning, our leadership will be in the back right there to pray with you. If you want to put on Christ in baptism, that's a starting point where we surrender our lives to Jesus, saying, Lord, I don't know what to do, but I know that you will have every step of the way, you will have my hand leading me to my ultimate home forever with you. And you will forgive me of my sins because you promised it. Not because of how good I am, but because of how good you are. This morning, if you have any, please come while we stand.